I'm so grateful for them. I'm grateful for the for the the ministers here that serve. Amen. And I'm grateful for our church. How many are proud and glad to be part of a church that's on fire? Amen. And when we have a special church, amen, and, and this movement, and we have something special, church. We have something special. You could go to other places, my friend, but there's something special, you know. And, and, and sometimes, you know, we may take it for granted. But the waters are stirring here in Victory Outreach, San Diego. Amen. And how many say that you're part of that stirring? Amen. I want to thank my wife, Brianna. I love you. Amen. Amen. Let's read Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 1. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple towards the east. For the front of the temple faced east, the water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar. He brought me out by way of north gate, of the north gate, and led me around on the outside to the outer, great, outer gate, gateway that faces east. And there was running water. Tell your neighbor, there was running water. Running out of the right side. And when the man went out to the east with the line in his hand, he measured. He measured. Say he measured. 1,000 cubits. And he brought me through the waters. The water came up to my ankles. Again, he measured 1,000. Say he measured. And he, and, and he brought me through the waters. And the water came to my knees. Again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the water, and it came to my waist. Again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river, say a river, that I could not cross. For the water was too deep. Water in which, which one must swim. A river that could not be crossed. He said to me, son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. When I returned there along the bank of the river were very many trees on, on one side and the other. Then he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region, goes down into the valley and enters the sea when it touches the sea its waters are healed and it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the river goes will live is anybody alive this morning there will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there for they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes <laughs> look at your neighbor and tell them everything will live wherever the river goes look at your other neighbor and tell them the, the river will live wherever it goes Look at the person behind you. If you ain't got nobody behind you, then find somebody next to them. Wherever the river goes, there's life. And life more abundantly. There's not death. There's life. Somebody give the Lord a praise for that. Come on. Amen. Have your seats this morning. Because these waters go there, for they will be healed. And everything will live wherever the river goes. How many could say this in this past five, six weeks that you've had an accelerated season with the Lord? How many have seen things in your life that you've been praying about for years, but God accelerated it in six weeks? 
Wave at me. Come on. Agree with me. If there's anybody that said, man, I was praying for a job and God gave me the job. I was praying for a breakthrough. God gave me the breakthrough. Because, see, when God wants revival to happen, he accelerates the things that need to come back to life. We've been seeing a shift in our church. We're walking in the shift. We're running in the shift. And it's not a seasonal shift. We heard from our pastor, this isn't a season. Look at your neighbor and tell him this isn't a season. But the season has come to walk into a movement. And now we are in a movement. The waters have been stirring. The, there has been a hunger. There's been a need. In the beginning of the year, what did we prophesy? That the wall was coming down. Does anybody believe the wall's still coming down? And we prophesied and we believe that there's going to be growth and God is going to position our church to reach the city of San Diego. But how many know that this has not just become a house that wants to reach the city, but he's become a house of prayer, a house of worship, a house where we could where we can make a, 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 a place for the Lord to abide in. And we can make altars where God can live in and where his presence is always invited. Where the rivers of living water can flow. How many can say amen? Ever since, our, ever since our pastors declared a shift, there's been an acceleration in our lives. You know, when I think about uh, the waters and I think about a house that's planted, it takes me to Psalms 1. But he, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings fruit in its season. How many know that you are seeing fruit in this season? You've been planted. You've been sowing. You've been right by the streams of water. And now you're seeing fruit. How many can say amen? See, there's honor when you align yourself with the house of God. Look at your neighbor and tell him there's honor. There's honor when you align yourself with the house of God. See, when you align yourself with the house of God, there's blessings that flow. When you align yourself with the man of God, there's blessings that flow. You're no longer saying, this isn't my agenda. I, I'm throwing everything that I have out of the way because why? I see the presence of God on this house. The rivers that flow. See, many people could testify that God is doing an internal work. Wave at me if God's just been doing an internal work in your life. God has just been wrecking you every morning. You get up and you're like, Lord, I just roll out of bed. I don't even, you don't even get on my knees. I just roll out of bed and just hit the, hit the floor face first. Come on, somebody. You just get out of bed. You want to pray. You have a desire for the presence. You have a hunger for the presence. God has been doing many things, but this is what I want to declare this morning. That this season is not just a shift right now. These are reference points for your journey. Reference points. Wave at me if you've been serving God five years and under. Oh, my Lord. There's the thing called reference points. Stones in your journey that you can look back at and say, I remember when God moved in my life then. And if he moved in my life then, he's the same God that can move in my life now. See, when you walk with the Lord, it's important that you never forget your reference points. What did Ezekiel talk about? He talk about, talked about the man who took out the line, and what did he do? He measured he put the line in and he measured. He put the line in the ground and he measured. See, my friend, what God is doing in this shift is he's giving you reference points. Reference points to remember the breakthrough. Remember who he is five years from now. How many know that he's going to continue to take us from glory to glory? You know, I'm going to be open this morning. This week has been a week of reference points in my life. If I could be open with you this morning. You know, it started out Monday when we went to Pastor Sonny's birthday. What a celebration for the man of God. How many can say amen about that? And we, it, the man of God, it was honored. It was a beautiful, beautiful time. And I was just a reference point for me. It was a reference point for me because, you know, I was birthed in the vision, man. I, 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 I had to be, I was reminded again of what the legacy that I'm part of. You know, I, I was able to see and it blessed my life that Pastor Chris and Anna brought their kids because they wanted them to see the vision. You know, I, I remember seeing the vision when I was just a kid in the home. And so it was a reference point for my life. Remembering where God is, how God has kept me and how he's grown me. 
You know, and then our worship team, we got the privilege to go help our pastor minister in Eagle Rock. You know, another reference point. And on our way, we, were, we stopped in Newport, and I was, looking, I was looking at the park, you know, and over 14 years ago, reference point, I looked at the space that my parents dropped me off in to go to the UTC where I got saved. Reference point. And I was reminded of how God moved in my life there in the training center. Reference point. Then we went to Eagle Rock that night. And I didn't even remember this. My mom had to remind me that when I was young, my father used to take our worship team to Pastor Augie's church and we would minister. So I used to go with my natural father. But this week I was able to go with my spiritual father. And it was a time of a reference point. My friend, never forsake the reference points in your life. This is a season of reference point in your life. You know, over a few weeks ago, like five, six weeks ago, my wife and I had the privilege to go to Boston with our pastors. And I know that they told their story, and it was just amazing. And I walked right in, reference point. The moment I walked in, because Sister Jean would always tell me about this church, and I'd say, Sister Jean, I, I believe you, but I just can't feel it through the YouTube. Come on, somebody. Sometimes you got to experience it in person. You know, pastor asked us to go, and we made it, and we made it, we made it to Boston. And I remember walking in, and the minute I walked in, I just felt the presence of God in my life like I have never felt. Reference point. You know, sometimes what happens is we have to get out of our environment and out of our comfort to realize how stagnant the water we're standing in really is. It's like when you take a bath for three hours. The water may feel a little warm, but it may look a little milky. Come on, somebody. It may look a little muddy, but you may not know. You got to get out of your comfort zone. You got to get taken out because, see, what God wants to do, he wants to take you out of still water and move you into running river water. The title of my message this morning is I'm All In. I'm all the way in. We're all the way in the river this morning, church. We can't allow ourselves to get out of the running water. We have to stay in the river of prayer, in the river of worship. And God wants to take you from your stagnant water into a running river that has life and life more abundantly. I don't know who I'm talking to this morning because I know there's a lot of people here that you are on fire. Is there anybody that's on fire this morning? And I know there's people that are feeding the flame. And I know there's leaders that say, I just want to be a vessel. But I'm, I'm talking to somebody that you're still stagnant in your situation. My friend, there's a river that's flowing. Jump in the river. See, when a Christian is stagnant, there's means for revival. Revival is an awakening. It's an interest in care for matters relating to personal religion. It's an evangelistic service. It's a time of an awakening. It's a time to wake up the things that are asleep. To wake up the things that are dormant. A revival is a time to wake up the things that could be even greater, but it's been suppressed. See, my friend, that's what is happening in our church. We are walking in revival. Stagnant Christians struggle with producing love. Look at your neighbor and tell him, do you love me? <laughs> See, stagnant Christians have a hard time producing love. There's a coldness about them, and there's an aura about them, and don't come close to me, and, and don't touch me. I don't like you. You got germs. Every time they want to give you a hug, they bust out the Purell and try to pour it in your hands. There's an aura. There's a, there's a, keep your three-foot distance, brother. You can't get this close. But my friend, stagnant Christianity will never get you to where you need to be. There should be love flowing out of us. There should be love in this river. There's love in this river. There's compassion in this river. There's warmth. My friend, how many know that we could take the city just if we love the people? See, we're living in a time where God is accelerating the kingdom. He's accelerating the kingdom. He's accelerating our church. I asked you in the beginning, who has seen an acceleration in their life in the past six weeks? It's not just for your personal gain. 
My friend, it's for the kingdom and it's for the house of God. God says, I'm accelerating you. Why? Because I need to use you. I want to use you. I want to use you. I want to use your life. I want to use you as a river for my honor and glory. He wants to do an accelerated work for souls, for families that are broken, for people that are lost. And how many can believe and, and say it this morning with conviction that he has rescued your life and you're never going back. See, we can't even go back. See, I'm not even talking about going back to the world. We can't even go back to our other season that we were in. You can't even go back to the way you used to pray. You can't even go back to the way that you used to preach. You can't even go back to the way you used to love. You can't even afford to go back to the way you used to eat or the way you used to get up or the way you used to dress. you got to stay in the river and let them wash you and let them push you and let them drain you out. Because why? God's purpose for your life is bigger than your situation what stops the river negativity what are they talking over there shift what are they talking about shift all the time they want to tell me why is the pastor taking long to preach why are they just worshiping for London? I don't they know I got here at 1050 to find my parking space so the service could start at 11 o'clock and I could take up and worship just for 20 minutes and I'll get my offering and my tithe and I'll and, I'll, and, I'll, and, I'll, and then I'll go hear the announcements and then I'll hear a cute special song and then I'll hear a cute word. See, see, some people just get a little negative because my friend, they're not in the river. And they say, oh, I want to just come in my agenda. And who's this brother sitting in my seat? Doesn't he know I've been here for 20 years? Doesn't he know that I sat in that seat for the same? See, you come in with these mechanics. And you come in with all these things that you think that you deserve, my friend. But my friend, that negativity is not part of the shift. See, when you're being negative, there's two things you're doing. One, you're either talking negative to yourself or you're talking negative to the person next to you. And my friend, it's not a time to be negative. But it's a time to prophesy. It's a time to speak life. It's a time to walk in the prophecy. It's a time to be a river of love. It's a time to be a river of gratefulness. It's a time to be a river that it says, I'm going to be everything that God has called me to be. See, Ezekiel seen the river of light. And our words are not just words. You tell your neighbor, your words are not just words. You're either prophesying or you're tearing down. You're either prophesying or you're tearing down. You're either speaking the word or you're speaking against it. It's, there's no in between. There's no gray area with God. It's black and white. What do you tell the church? You're either hot or cold. You're not lukewarm. There's only, there's only, there's no gray area. You're either prophesying or you're talking negative. Some of you just need to get negativity. Well, brother. We have prayer again? Again? Since when is prayer bad? Since when is it bad to pray? Since when is it against you to pray? Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue has the power of life and and those who love it will eat its fruit. You want to eat an apple of life or an apple of death? Your words are going to change your environment. You're either sowing seed or you're eating it, my friend. Let's sow it. How many can say amen? Second thing is a hard heart. Heart and heart. Were you always hard, man? Too hard. Too hard sometimes, man. Too hard. No grace. <laughs> can I get a little grace? Come on, somebody. Sometimes our, heart, our hearts can get a little hardened. Can we be honest this morning? I know we're in the shift, and I know we're in the movement, but, bro, you're still in the flesh sometimes. And it's all right. Because in the water is where your heart gets softened. 
See, I'm just trying to encourage somebody. I'm not saying nobody's perfect in this place. I'm trying to invite you to stay in the river, to stay in the water, to stay where God's presence is, to stay grateful, to stay humble, to stay in a place where God says, I could take this heart and mold it and conform it like mine. I'll make a say amen. amen. See, David wrote the Psalm 5110, creating me a pure heart, O God. And, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. A steadfast spirit. Not immovable. Not shakable. A steadfast spirit. A steadfast spirit. That you're planted. You're, you're saying, man, I'm staying here in the water. My heart isn't seeking ambition. My heart isn't seeking other things. It's seeking the presence of God. That's all we want, church. We know the calling on this house, so what do we need? More of God? You could do more on your knees than you could do on your feet. Our weapons have changed. Our weapons have been more equipped. Our weapons have been sharpened. We're no longer trying to operate in the flesh. My friend, you can only go so far in your own strength. But it's when you get on your knees and you pray and you say, God, I can't do this task, but I believe that you can fill me and use me and by and with you I can do all things. The kingdom is needed more than ever. The church is needed more than ever. God wants to move and use us as honor, as vessels of honor, instruments in his hand. As we strengthen our church. See, one thing my pastor was teaching me is that there's two banks in the church. There's the bank of worship and there's the bank of prayer. And as we strengthen those two banks, the river can flow. So what have we been doing? Prayer and worship. Prayer and worship. You, you've seen our pastor, the, the shepherd of this house, walk up here. Sometimes he don't even go into his message. He just wants to worship and pray. Why? Because we're building the banks of worship and prayer. Building the banks of worship and prayer. As we strengthen the banks, the river can run faster with more power and more distance. It's our job to build the banks of the river. My friend, don't allow laziness to take over. Don't slumber in the house of God. Don't give the shaky foot when you're praying. <laughs> if you got to get up and walk around, do what you got to do. Get a Red Bull. Get some coffee. Get some of that Cafe 67 anointing in you. See, you guys need to get a coffee that says anointed coffee. This one is going to keep you lit all day long. Our pastor declared it, that it's time to pick up the shovel and dig. And God is looking for people who have a desire for fresh water and a hunger for fresh bread. And God is looking for people who want the fire of God to fill their lives and allow God to use their lives. How many can say amen? There's importance with a river. Say your neighbor, the river's important. You know, the river brings nutrients into the water, produces nutrients. It, it brings it. It brings it. It carries nutrients all over the earth. Rivers provide excellent habitation so crops can grow. There's a purpose for the river. It's not just to look at. It's not just to, to watch and just to see it go by you. It transports Rivers transport goods and rivers transport people to get into another destination. It, it allows the, the farming agriculture to be ripe and ready to, to use. And it gives energy. It gives power. It produces power. It's a supplement for power. So what am I trying to tell you today? That the river is flowing from this house and, the glow, and it's going to flow through you wherever you go. Let's take it in this, that wherever you go, you'll bring nutrients to people's life. 
You're going to offer something that the world can't offer. Wherever you go, the river's going to flow through you. And whatever you touch, it's going to be inhabited. Wherever you go, you're going to be a transporter into the presence of God. Wherever you go, the river's going to flow through you. And you're going to be able to be an energy, a power in a place where there is no power. The river. Tell your neighbor, stay in the river. People are going to see a difference in you. They're going to feel the presence on you and in you. How many can say you have a testimony right now of somebody that felt something different about you? Mm. Wherever you go, there's going to be a different spirit on you. Your family that may be cold or hurt with the church, when you walk in the room, they're going to break because the presence of God is going to be on you. And they're going to remember what it was like when God saved their life. My friend, I'm trying to prophesy something over your life. That wherever you go, the Lord will be with you. And wherever you go, the atmosphere will change. Why? Because you're not just calling it a shift. You're walking in the shift. And you're walking in the movement. Wherever you step your foot, you will be a blessing. Stay in the river. Now it's not a time to call in sick to the prayer meeting. Now is not a time to stay in bed when the women are praying, calling down heaven at 7 in the morning. Now is not a time, men of God, to stay in that, to stay home on a Sunday morning. Now is not the time. It's time to get at the altar. Now is the time to stay in the river. Now is the time to drink from the well. Why? Because God's plan for your life requires more power. It's a time where we are in the river. Love that flows from your life will soften the hardest hearts. Honor that flows from your life will soften people's hearts. How many can say amen? I mentioned in the beginning, there are two banks that allow the river to flow. Prayer and worship. Tell your neighbor, prayer and worship. Prayer and worship. When these two elements are built, then the river can run with power. The first bank is prayer. Write prayer down. When I think about prayer, and this scripture has been on my heart for the past three months. We've been building, man. We've been building in the music. We've been building. We've been building. And I, and I begin to ask God, man, God, I know you're getting ready. You're getting ready to do something big. You're getting ready to do something big. And I begin to feel it. And the, the thing that kept ringing in my heart was the prayer of Jabez. That you enlarge my territory. That you would enlarge my territory. That you would bless me, oh Lord. See, Jabez was smart. He prayed. He prayed. And he asked the Lord to enlarge his territory. Why? Because there needs to be a stretching in our lives for God to use us at the capacity he wants to use us. See, you may have came in one way, but God never wants to have you stay the same. He wants to take you from glory to glory to glory to glory to glory. And he wants to use you. But there has to be a prayer in our life. Jabez cried out to God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. See, my friend, this is a time where we could, we're going to be stretched. Tell your neighbor, you're going to be stretched. Stretched. You're going to be stretched. You're going to be stretched. You know, I was out of shape spiritually when I went to Boston too. My feet were killing me. <laughs> and my feet were hurting bad. I mean, they were hurting bad. I had to take a seat for a little bit. You know, it, it, was, a, it, was, it, was, something, I, it was something different. And I had, to, I had to really say, man, I am really out of shape spiritually. You know, I, I really need to get caught up to where these guys are. See, there's a 20 by 20 movement going on. Come on, somebody. How many know we got to get our spirit in shape too? How many can say amen? See, Charles Finney, a revival said, a revival may be expected when Christians have a spirit of prayer for revival. That is when they pray as if their hearts were set upon it. When Christians have the spirit of prayer for a revival, when they go about groaning out their heart's desire. When they have real travail of soul, enlarging requires stretching, going deeper and wider, uncomfortable faith. Uncomfortable faith, not ordinary prayer, 
Not ordinary time of worship. Not ordinary times with God. Not saying the same prayer. Not singing to the same song. My friend, it is time to get in spiritual shape. How many can say amen? For some of us, it's not about enlarging our tent. It's not about stretching. It's for some of us, it's about getting rid of clutter in your life. See, you've already been stretched. You've already been poured into. You've been praying. You've been fasting. You've been, you've been doing what your leader told you to do. But it's not the, the fact that you're not being stretched. It's the fact that you're not cleaning house. So you're doing the right thing spiritually, but there's something that you have to do is take an intake look at your life. See, one thing I cannot stand is leftovers in the fridge. My God, there gets to a point where I just go into the fridge and I throw everything away. I'll throw the Tupperware away. I don't care. I don't care if it was the Costco bought 30 piece pack and I lose a piece of my collection. I don't care if it's in the fridge for too long. It's going. It's going in the trash because a place that's meant for storage and a place that's meant to keep things fresh no longer is fresh, but it's beginning to smell like the old food, like the old thing that's inside of it. My friend, your heart is not a place to keep things for too long. Sometimes you got a clean house. Sometimes you need to say, this needs to leave. And this bitterness I've been holding on to needs to go. I've been praying. I've been fasting, but I've been holding on to this hurt and I gotta let it go and I gotta let this thing go why because God says I'm trying to keep your heart a place of freshness and you're making it smell like Gina Keenis from two months ago get rid of it bro get rid of the flat soda that's on the door that's been there since your kids party for six months get rid of the meat that's been in your freezer and it looks all frostbitten get rid of the thing that's trying to stop you from allowing the river to flow my friend it's time that we get into prayer and say god i need to make room for you the old things must die the old things need to go out and into the trash. The old things need to get thrown away. The old things need to get thrown away. And my friend, you need to go buy some new food. Yeah. Somebody need to get on Pinterest and get an idea of what a fridge is supposed to look like. Somebody need to get in the prayer closet and say, God, you heard my cry. Enlarge my territory and bless me that I can be used by you. Tell your neighbor, get rid of the chilaquiles. Don't look at me like that because I guarantee if I go to your house right now, you got leftovers. <laughs> You're trying to save your birthday cake, the top piece from like 10 months ago. Let it go, bro. I'll buy you a new cake after. Let it go. <laughs> Let it go, man. Let it go. You having fun this morning? You have a good time, amen. The second bank, second bank is worship. Say worship. Worship. I'm going to bring it to the close. And second Samuel chapter 6, when I think of worship, and I think of a reverence, and I think of a way to worship, I love chapter 6 of Second Samuel. Who knows the story? Who knows the story of 2 Samuel chapter 6? What did David do? David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God. He was bringing it back with him, city of David. So what did they do? They began to prepare. How many of you, we got to prepare for the presence of God? Amen. We don't just come in here and wing it. There's no winging it. We prepare. You know, the music ministry, they work hard. They prepare. You know, the, the women, they, they come in, they prepare. They prepare a word. When our pastor speaks, he prepares a word. It's not just winging it. We're not winging it up here, you know. We're not just winging it. This isn't a, a, a wing it session. <laughs> you know, and so David, they prepared. What did they do? They prepared. And those of you know that story, David had... Cho had 
chosen men. Chosen men. Look at your neighbor and tell him you're a chosen man or woman. Whoever you got. He had chosen men transport the ark. Chosen men. So as they're transporting, the Bible says that they were singing. They were playing. They were playing instruments. They were, they were worshiping. They were doing all the right things. The Bible even says that they, it was a brand new cart that they put the ark on. Read it. It's in chapter 6. That they put it on a brand new cart. They went out there and they carved it, you know. They made it look all beautiful, brand new tires. They carved it up, you know. They had the carpenter chiseling. You know, making rose beads on the side, making it look beautiful. Why? Because we honor the presence of God. We prepare a place for him to inhabit his praises. We prepare a place where he can abide. We prepare a place where his presence can live in. So they did the right thing. They did the right thing. But there comes a portion of scripture in there when Uzzah, say Uzzah, they came to what's called Nakin's threshing floor. And what happens? What happens? The, the ark falls at the threshing floor. It's not a mistake that it didn't fall at the beginning, but it fell at the threshing floor. See, at a threshing floor is where wheat is separated. It's where wheat is separated. And it sifts the shaft from the wheat. And you know, and you, you've seen it. They grab the fork and they throw it up. And what happens? The wind takes the shaft and the wheat falls. So they get to the threshing floor. And what happens? It falls. Now, I don't want to take anything out of scripture, out of context. But if I have a little bit of liberty, when I think of Uzzah, he did the right thing. I mean, if you're... Beautiful, brand new glass falls. What are you going to do? Try to get it. If your child falls, what are you going to try to do? Grab him. He did the right thing. But he did the right thing for something that deserved more honor than just a quick grab. I wonder if he would allow the presence to fall and if he went into a place of repentance for allowing the presence to fall. I don't know. Some commentators even say that Uzzah made the cart fall. So he had a reason to touch the presence. That's a whole other story. You're trying to provide your own breakthrough, but that's, we're not going to go there. <laughs> but this is what happened. They got to the threshing floor. And what did God do? He killed Uzzah. Striked him down in his anger. And David got scared. So what did David do? Took the ark to whose house? Bet even. And what did it do? It sat there for three months. You could play, Matt. Sat there for three months. And as it sat, what happened? Blessings. 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 Pouring out. Blessings pouring out. So what did David do? Oh, shoot. <laughs> I got to get back and get the presents. But what do I got to change? Leaders, listen to me. Christians, listen to me who've been serving God for a long time. Recognize the difference from when David brought the cart out, the perfect cart, had the nice songs and the great dancers and the great presentation and the great coming in and looking good and looking dignified to compare to what happened three months later. There was a defining moment. David recognized 
that he wasn't sacrificing. See, you can give God your worship and you can sing a pretty song. You can look good in the house of God. You could come in and think and try to put on a facade like everything's going good, but there's so much going on. You could go into a place where you lift up your hands so beautifully and you have a perfect posture of trying to worship the Lord. And you look great. You look beautiful. All your makeup stays on. None of your eyelashes fall off. But David seen what he had to do. See, everything was perfect. The right cart, the right chosen men. But he didn't sacrifice. That's why we have to give sacrifice when we praise and worship. So what did he do? When he got the cart, those of you know the story, what did he do? He took one, two, three, four, five, six, and he sacrificed the calf took another one didn't matter how long it was going to take to get back to the city i'm not moving into your presence until i sacrifice something and god is saying you may be taking your your worship with me you may be coming into my house and lifting up your hands but you got to take a step and you got to take a step and you got to get closer and you got to get closer all right right there sacrifice something then take another step 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 and sacrifice something my friend when you begin to sacrifice in your worship God responds to sacrifice God responds to sacrifice some of us been trying to worship pretty some of us been trying to worship dignified but what happened David as they went into the city was dancing undignified was in a place where he said I don't care who's looking at me I don't care who's watching me I came to worship my God was a sacrifice of praise and I lay it down at the altar and if I gotta shout if I gotta shout if I gotta praise if I gotta jump